So if we start with, uh, particularly in tracking solutions with uh, pivots, you know, uh, track maintenance has always been a, a issue and forever there's been bias ply tires. We've recently um, started seeing a lot more uh, pneumatic radial tires. They have some really good advantages and a few disadvantages. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, plastic tires. Uh, NF Tracks is a solution that Lindsay has uh, that's kind of a hybrid solution. It's helpful in some areas and not so helpful in other areas. Uh, there are solutions with three-wheel base beams and four-wheel base beams that are out there to help you, you know, try to manage those tracks. You're never going to really eliminate, eliminate them. It's just how do you go about managing the tracks. So um, this is kind of a, a shot of uh, some different things, but uh, you're, you're, you've got like a, oh, come back here. You've got, uh, over here, you've got just a small pneumatic tire. This is like a 38-inch pneumatic tire. And these are all in the same field or same area. This is a uh, radial tire, and then this is an NF track in a, in a different area. Um, so what I would tell you is, is you guys are pretty familiar with just your standard bias ply tires. The problem with, with pneumatic bias ply tires is they have about a seven to eight year life, and then they're dead. You know, it used to be they built a better tire, but that's a manufacturer deal. Uh, the imported tires are worse than the domestic tires, and the domestic tires aren't correct. Um, I think what I see in the radial tires is they seem to be a lot better quality, but there are very few true radial tires out there, and they are uh, expensive in, uh, for the most part on a new machine. If you look at a 12-4-38 uh, tire versus an 11-2-38 tire, you're looking at about $500 per tower additional cost to put radial tires on them. Key thing with radial tires is run the pressure down. Just like it's all the same reasons you run radials on tractors, same reason you should run radials here. You have a lot better footprint, you get a lot better traction, but uh, it helps you manage that track. Uh, so, but you run that pressure down uh, somewhere between 11 and 15 pounds is all the pressure you want to run in there. And they, they do look like they're loaded and flat and that kind of stuff, but that's the way they're supposed to look. And uh, um, Trello boards are some of the better tires out there. Bridgestone makes some good stuff. Uh, there's some various and sundry other folks that make uh, radial tires. Uh, and then there's some hybrid stuff that basically is the same thing as a bias ply tire. It doesn't really, doesn't give you the same performance that a real radial tire does. So just, it's kind of buyer beware as far as that goes. Uh, the NF track is basically, I'll show you another picture in a minute, but it's a belt strapped around the disc with uh, points on it, and uh, it's really good in, in things like sandier soils, lighter soils. They work extremely well there. You get them into heavier soils, and any time that your windshield wipe them, they're not a very good solution because you just end up with so much water at the edge of the field that they'll want to try to go to the bottom. If you've got a heavier soil and you really want to do some work with track management, radial tires are probably the best answer. So, so, But if you look at ground pressure, and this is really... Uh, you know, what your ground pressure is. The, there's not much difference in size between the, the 12 438 and 11 238, but look at the difference in the ground pressure. And the NF tracks at all depths, irregardless at whether it's a uh, surface or you're three or four inches deep, it always stays at about 400 pounds per square inch. But when you get rid of that bottom underneath it, it'll go and, there's, and it doesn't have the ability to track out of it the way that a pneumatic tire does. So that's just. Uh, just kind of a warning there. They have good fits, but they're not a fit for everything. Um, this is kind of a comparison, same field, same day, uh, between a pneumatic tire and a, uh, uh, a uh, NF track. This was about three inch, or about six inches deep, and this was a couple of inches deep. It wasn't much at all. But there's a lighter soil. We've made some improvements to the NF tracks. These used to be just a straight point down and up, and we've added these little wings to it, and it's, it's uh, give them about a 10 times life wear on them. So they continue to improve them. It's one of those things where product just gets better as you learn. And you guys have taught us a lot. Uh, I was visiting with uh, Will Island over at uh, Dalhart the other day, and he said that under 10 inch spans, which these are not recommended to go under because of the weight of the spans, 
uh, he's getting really good performance out of them, so he's pretty tickled with what they're doing underneath a 10 inch span versus what the originals were. So, um, we also do some things with uh, three wheel base beams, that kind of stuff, and uh, it works out really well. Um, it's, uh, but it's not really all about the tires. There's things that you can do with irrigation timing that helps you. If you create a, a position where you've just got it too wet, you, you create an issue where there is no bottom to it and you're gonna sink and you're gonna develop tracks. So helping yourself with irrigation timing, sprinkler package spacing, uh, nozzle options around the, the, uh, the towers is a good way to do things. Uh, directed applications, we see a lot in the, in the desert southwest part where, where we've got uh, spraying away from the towers and also doing drive wheel tracks where they raise that track up. You'll see most of the pivots around Roswell, New Mexico, Portales area where uh, they've got it burned up and the, and the machine actually runs uh, on top of a berm and, and the water kind of drifts away from it. And they give up that little bit of area to keep from having tracks with the volume of water that they're putting on and the type of soils that they have and that kind of stuff. Uh, I said we had addressed plastic tires and uh, uh, understand that as a manufacturer we get to look at all of the options they bring them to us and tell us how wonderful they are, and then we go out and tear them up and break them, figure out what the problems are with them. If you want to destroy drivetrain on a, on a center pivot, put plastic tires on it. It's a great way to do it. Just buy a pallet of gearboxes while you're doing it. It may last a year or two, but boy, when they crack and you fill them full of sand and water, it'll just rip the drivetrain off of a, off of a center pivot. And uh, just we never recommend them. Fact is, on a new machine, we'll void the drivetrain warranty on it on a new pivot for putting plastic tires on it because we know what it's going to do to them. We've tried them for years and all of the steel wheel options, guys, we're a welding shop. If we could go in, it, all Lindsay Manufacturing is is the biggest, nicest welding shop you've ever seen in your life. And if we could build a steel tire and make it work on a center pivot, we would have done it a long time ago. Can't do it because it just tears the pivots to pieces can get no longevity out of them. So you need to stay away from stuff that doesn't have any give to it. If you look at all of the things that we were looking at in the pneumatic tires, the radial tires, even the NF track, when you start that machine, it gives it some give to it and you need that in your drivetrain. You know, and you're seeing lots of like the driveline couplers where you've got all of that stress on the drivetrain. You're seeing a lot of pretty solid driveline couplers out there today. and. Uh, that driveline coupler is kind of your safety fuse in the system. You want that to give up before you start blowing gearboxes apart and ripping center drives off of drive tubes and that kind of stuff. And that's the reason those uh, driveline couplers are what they are as they come out on a new pivot. Okay. So do y'all have any questions on tracking solutions, way to do things differently? Y'all want to talk about that at all? Does that kind of make some sense? And, and I know I'm pretty negative on the steel wheels and the plastic wheels, but I've seen some of the most horrible wrecks that you could ever see. And guys put that stuff out there, and you know, three or four years later, it's all in a stack behind the barn. Just just creates so much trouble. And I just recommend you stay away from it. It's nothing but trouble. Okay. All right. So, and you heard Joe say this a little bit. You know, everything that that we're about between the dealer and manufacturer and you guys as growers, producers is, is trying to figure out how to make you more efficient, more effective, or more productive. If we haven't accomplished one of those three things, we hadn't done a thing for you. It's just snake oil at that point, right? So productivity, you've heard a lot of stuff about spring for packages. Closer together, closer to the ground, you're gonna get more water to crop availability. We, we discussed that, right? So here's the part that I didn't really hear much anybody discuss. Those orifices out there have a lifetime, and you can go, you can figure it any way you want, but the easiest way to look at it is, is somewhere with the volume of water that we pump and the sand that's in the water, about seven years you need to go through and just completely put new orifices in a machine and cost you less than a couple of bucks a piece. When you get done and you've got all those orifices in a bucket, don't go put them back in the barn. <laughs> Throw them away. Put them on a sale. 
it do, yeah, do something else with them, but do not, do not put them back in the barn because they were worn out and you're not going to take them and fix something with them. Because that's what will happen is you go in there and dig around and say, oh, well, that one's close. It's within a couple of sizes. We'll go put that one back on. And today we're talking a lot about precision application of water, getting it where it needs to be, when it needs to be, so that you can do the most with it. The other thing that I'll say is on just kind of as a rule of thumb, you know, at what point in time is the pressure regulator done? If you go through and you've replaced orifices and it's time to replace them again, get rid of the regulators at the same time. You can usually get somewhere between 10 and 15 years out of a regulator, but at that point in time, it becomes a straight piece of pipe. And uh, Leon said something about testing regulators. If you're going to test a regulator, you put a, uh, a pressure gauge on the bottom side of the regulator, but you also have to put an orifice there to allow water through it because otherwise it'll just leak enough water through there so it'll, it'll show you an erroneous reading like it's, it's running at line pressure. So, and you need to do it where you've got plenty of pressure to, to set them. Yes, Ken. Just to jump the point from Nelson on their regulators, they say as soon as it starts to leak out of some of the silos, the regulator's done. Yeah, that's another good, good way to look at, look at it. But at the very least, you get a couple of rounds down the road with them, throw them away, start over. You know, yeah, they cost a little bit of money, but they, they really do a good job for you. So productivity really starts in the sprinkler package. Because anything else we do after you, after that, if you don't have the sprinkler package right, we we it's we you limit what we can do to help you. Okay, that's where your productivity comes from. That's where you're going to produce a crop. Okay, effectiveness really gets down to. At this point, if you've got all that other stuff right, then it's about getting control of the irrigation so that it doesn't have control of you. Okay? So you can monitor it, and that's helpful. But really having control of it is where you really, the rubber meets the road. And there's a lot of options to do in that. And Joe showed you some. I'm going to show you some more. And then efficiency really gets down to, at this point, guys, it's, you've got to think of it like technology and seed. You get to stack different traits to accomplish what you want to do with, with your seed. In the irrigation today, it's getting to be the same way. So, so you take your control system, and then on top of that, you can stack your as-planted data so that you can keep track of your as-irrigated data so you know where the water went and where it went on the circle. And then you can do things with imagery and moving stuff between platforms like John Deere Connect and uh, Climate Core now partners with us so that you can move data directly out of their platforms into our platform and back and forth so that it allows you to really do something with your irrigation instead of just putting water out. Okay, so, so you're going to hear me talk a little more about precision application of water, not just irrigating, but really putting water where it needs to be. So. Monitoring is really about reducing downtime, keeping your uptime up, reducing as many field issues as you can because we know pivots never break down right before you get there. They break down right after you left. And so it's how long did it sit there in that spot or without irrigating if you have well kills before you got back to it. So that's what monitoring does for you. It reduces your labor. It improves your ability to get where you need to be when you need to get get there and there's a lot of water savings just in that portion of it because of putting the water where you need it when you need it. Um, in control it's about application efficiency, it's about gathering data, it's about utilizing tools like variable rate irrigation. This stuff is out of the box today guys. Uh, herbicide and fertilizer applications, um, being able to start machines and the difference between monitoring at a level and actually controlling machine really gets down to can you start it and can you control things that you want to do and push it to do what to speed up slow down and do what you want to do besides just monitoring it maybe being able to stop it so so if you look at that in the current situation the technology available it's simple it's affordable the ROI on it is very very good when uh, Brian, when you first started putting control technology out there, we were probably $4,000, $5,000 machine putting it out there. Payout on it is way less than a year probably. And today with today's technology, you can put that stuff out there and payout's about 30 days. You know, it's, it's really that immediate to you. 
um, management of numerous pieces of equipment, y'all are all doing that. Being able to manage your drip, your pumps, all your VFDs on the same platform is totally doable today. This is all out of the box stuff, ready to do. And it's all as portable as your phone, your computer, your iPad, your tablet, whatever you're working on. Uh, variable rate irrigation is part of today's solutions. So anything out of the box should include variable rate irrigation right, right there uh, available to you. And then there's things that you're gonna see more of variable rate irrigation, uh, and we'll get into precision variable rate irrigation and how it works here in a little bit, but uh, it's readily available and usable too. So, Phil, what is field net? It's, your, it's remote management, it's web-based, it's 24-7, always available, and it's all of the applications that make that decision-making easier to do. And you can add sensors to it. Uh, where we're headed more often than not today is using that big data available to you across the internet and all of the, the people that are out there creating weather data and that kind of stuff and how do you use that to make that work well for you. So, um, so we can control pivots, laterals, drip micro end guns, injectors, pumps, um, being able to get graphical data on it. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can do with it. Um, I'm, probably going to see if I can set up here in a little bit and uh, just walk y'all through a little bit of stuff. But one thing to note is all of the colors on the screen uh, in the world of field net means something. So blue is running wet, gray is off, orange is, is chemigating, green's running dry, and uh, red means you've got some kind of alarm. Not necessarily a shutdown, it could be a warning depending upon how you've got that set up. Basically anything that we're monitoring, whether it's voltage, flow, pressure, whatever, you can get a warning as well as alarms and so those are all configurable to you. One thing I want to point out to you guys is that um, if, you're, if you have the ability to run the machine on dry yet still run water to it, um, you always need to run the pressure switch on or the water on. And the reason is, is that makes uh, all of these systems track how much water is actually applied. Otherwise, it thinks it's running dry even though it's running wet. And so all of your irrigation data will be screwed up if you don't run them with the pressure switch on. In the world of Zomatic, there's one other reason to do that. Because if you run it dry, and even though you've got water on it, it disables the pressure switch settings. So you get no warnings, no alarms. And one of the things about Zomatic pivots is, is if they ever walk around far enough that it breaks that uh, split metal coupler in between uh, the spans, there's a kind of a real light rubber boot in there and that bush. It should blow out when it does, it'll drop the pressure down immediately and it'll shut off on a pressure shutdown if it's set anywhere close to right. So it's, it's kind of an emergency backup and keeps it from walking around into itself and tearing up thousands of dollars worth of steel. So uh, on drip systems, um, this is kind of graphical interface, but all of the valves that are blue, all the zones that are blue running the grays are set to run, tells you where it's at. Uh, all of the same kind of interface is available on, on do, in your pivot equipment also because it kind of shows you where it's at and what it's doing. Uh, pump controls are uh, kind of one of those things that just keeps developing. We spend a lot of time and energy doing pump controls. The one thing that I'll tell you is there's plenty of stuff out there that you can do one-to-one. -one from a pivot to a pump and shut down and start pumps if you can uh, do that. Now I understand you guys with just gas wells, you wanna be there to start them and you wanna be there to shut them down. Get that, that's okay. But if you got electric wells, it gives you a lot of opportunities to do some other things and where you can, it's, it's pretty cool stuff to be able to start and stuff, start things. But you can have multiple pivots running, configured to different wells and then by using dynamic demand, based on what equipment's running, it tells the variable frequency drive how much pressure it needs in any combination. So you set all the combinations up and so it makes it very dynamic about how, how the, the pressure system provide, the wells providing water to you, um, how they react. And so it's, it really makes it very efficient. So it's not just a set point, it's a set of set points. And if you shut something down, it also readjusts the entire system so it's a lot of computer stuff in the background talking to one another but it's really neat and it works really really well 
And one of the things also to note is there's all kinds of performance charts and stuff that you can uh, you can get as well as just full-time management of your uh, energy consumption. Um, so in reports, we've got water usage reports, uh, chem, chemical application reports, all kinds of stuff. Anything that we track, you can download and manipulate. Uh, you can download it as a CSV file, which means you can manipulate it in, uh, in Excel. So anything that we're tracking, you can, uh, you can download and move around. So uh, all of this stuff is available to you. So if, if from the day that you start filling that, to today, all of that, all of that data is yours. It's available. We've kept all of that. So some of the stuff that's been out there ten years running, all that data is still available. Um, the new uh, FieldNet mobile app is is pretty neat. It, when we brought it out last year. There's lots of enhancements coming uh, on the thing this year. Um, and once again, you can go to um, to the app store and just down the download the FieldNet app, and on that FieldNet app, uh, it, it, uh, it gives you a lot of data. So it's very, it's very much just like looking at a panel, and, and irregardless of what panel it is, if there's something that's not available to you, it'll be grayed out, but the, all, of the, all of the interface looks the same regardless of what kind of panel that it is that it's communicating with. So, it uh, does intuitive polling, so it's just like um, in most of the other apps that you use to get it to refresh, you just pull it down and it'll refresh the app. And the reason that we make it do it that way is because downloading all that stuff creates a lot of data consumption, so there's no sense in downloading it every time you open it. If you want to just open it and make changes, then it doesn't download all that. Uh, all the software you should put in there are viewable. All your status indicators are all right here so you can tell exactly where you're at. Uh, it lets you know how long it is to the next stop or change and tells you where the pivot's at and where it's going, which direction it's going, and allows you to change um, change your circle time, your depth, your percent, all that stuff's readily available to you there so you can easily go in and tell it what you want to do. You can do multiple things, then just hit apply and uh, it dumps it all over there and makes it happen. Um, the service stop, you can tell it to repeat or not repeat, so it's just a checkbox to save auto reverse and auto restart features are readily turned on and turned off within the app. Uh, we remove the edit mode so you don't have to go to an edit mode, you just make the changes and hit apply. Um, so it has a map view, and the map view is really cool for a lot of things, but it also allows you to use a drive to function that's in there if you're sending somebody someplace that they don't know in there. They're on your, uh, in your group of folks that are using, uh, you can just tell them go here, here's your pivot road and it'll drive them to it basically. So um, gives you all of the information on your layers and uh, your quick tray on it. So it's, it's all pretty nifty, straightforward, easy to use stuff. So um, in gun settings, you guys are saying, well, why in the world is he talking about in gun settings? So, the in gun settings are really cool because it uses the satellite imagery. It allows you to uh, enable and disable them, it allows you to touch, drag them around, nudge them because you can hit on the plus and minus buttons. You just grab this, cert, this little piece here and you can drag it this way, drag that one that way. And uh, say, well, that's really neat if we had in guns, that'd be cool. Well, we needed to do that with soft barriers. And we, if you squirt a little water on a uh, county road in Nebraska, probably not a big deal, but if you run it over a barn or something, it's probably not a good thing. <coughs> so what we did was we used this to figure out how to do it, and now this becomes your new soft barrier uh, uh, unit. So everything that's in red is behind the barrier. It's only watering there. So if you've got two crops, you can pull your soft barriers around, get it nudged up exactly where you want. The yellow line is exactly where the pivot's at. So if you needed this to be right up on that pivot, you bring it right up on it and dump it right on it, and you still nudge it around. So things that we learned about how to use in guns, we've translated that into how to use soft barriers. So this, in May, this becomes available to you guys in the app. So within the next 30 days or so, y'all will see uh, that show up just next time you open the app, it's there. So it makes it really easy to use. So, and like I say, it's still got that nudge precision available. 
and then uh, you can scroll through the pivots as well as using uh, the map view. So it's just whatever is easiest for you to do. So this looks very much the same way that the map view does. And there's some neat things in it where if, if you're if it's easier for you to use a white background than a black background, you can change it in your profile settings. There's a lot of things that you can do. If you've got people that read and understand Spanish better than they read and understand English, they can change theirs to Spanish, their profile settings to Spanish. All their stuff comes in in Spanish versus English, yes. Is this Spain Spanish or Mexico Spanish? Because I've had that problem with uh, the John Deere uh, computers and the tractors. I, I'm going to say that it's Spain Spanish. It's it's okay. deep Mexico okay. Spanish. It's not going to be the stuff we talk on the border. So, yeah. So yeah. it'll be a different kind of. I have never hired any Spaniards, so I'll, I'll keep yeah. my eyes open. Yeah, but you might try it and see how it works for them. If it doesn't work, well, you're no no further lost than you were. Um, FieldNet Advisor is kind of the the next uh, next I don't know uh, frontier out there, and in its simplest form, FieldNet Advisor is irrigation scheduling okay and it's it really gives it takes into all of the stuff that y'all learned about irrigation scheduling soil types need for deficit irrigation the need for cultural practices are you conventional till or are you no-till we all know that a no-till soil will infiltrate water a lot better than a conventional till even better than a than a, uh, a strip till you know, so you, all of those cultural practices come into into play, as well as how much trash is out in the field. Field and advisor takes all of that stuff into uh, into uh, consideration. So so it helps you with irrigation. It helps you with with looking at where you're at with the crop. It helps you with keeping track of where the weather is. It's predictive. It is not reactive. Where soil moisture probes are looking at what happened in the past. FillNet Advisor is looking 15 days in the future and historical averages from 10 years in the past. It grids the field down into five meter by five meter squares. So what that tells you is that by type, by, by soil type, by crop, by ET, by irrigation amounts, by rainfall amounts and soil water, it, tell, it, it tries to derive and, and assist you with determining when and how much water to put on. So when you grid that down and you look at a growing season, there's something over 8 million data points that get crunched in using something like FieldNet Advisor. And then the BRI Advisor is really nifty because it generates your variable rate irrigation plans for you. So it just, this is just kind of a graphical, this is how it's all laid together. Uh, so you put in the crop and when it was put in or you download that there, if you uh, if you using something like John Deere Connect or Climate Core, who is now a partner as of uh, earlier this week, um, it automatically downs a so downloads a soil map. So we used U.S. Web Soil Survey, just like Leon was showing you earlier today, to go get those soil types and stuff for all the same reasons he was showing you. If you've got a map that you've done on your farm or you've uh, you've mapped that farm and you've got better data, you can download that directly into FieldNet Advisor to help you do a better job with the, the irrigation. Uh, it also uses that hyper uh, local weather data and it has irrigated history. So when you set the field up, it goes back and looks at what you've done for irrigation, particularly your pre-water to help get that present available water that you're working with. And then it uses a soil water balance calculation uh, that, that's been researched for 40 years to track that water. And we've done a lot of working with that to make it more dynamic and work uh, easier and better inside of this, this program. Uh, and then it grids the field so that we've got a lot of resolution to it and then generates recommendations for the BRI prescriptions. And you say, well, do I have BRI available to me? Anything in field now has variable rate irrigation available to you outside of just the monitor only products. So, and irregardless of how old the panel is, if it's an old um, Ames panel, could have been an older Boss panel, those things with the change of a chip become VRI enabled. Any of the vision panels that don't show up as VRI enabled take a flash update that takes about 15 seconds once you hook it up. 
to flash update the panel and you've got VRI enabled. All of the pivot control products, all of the new products that have gone out in the last probably five years already have VRI enabled. It's straight out of the box. It's there ready to work. Okay. Um, it, it does give you your, your schedule and your depletion amounts as you go through the schedule. It gives you all of your fields in one graphical uh, um, presentation where you can see all of the fields to see where you're at and all of that stuff is configurable. Um, you can use precision BRI by controlling every valve on the machine if you want to. It's expensive to do. This part is the stuff that's out of the box. Every degree as it goes around the field, it can track and modify how much water that needs to go on. Okay. So, and it gives you good information about how all this stuff is working, what your available water is, it, and uh, it allows you to set a minimum amount that you want to irrigate because, and, and it's part of the reason for slowing down, and we've talked about, you know, you want to try to put as much on in the pass as you can without creating runoff, and by closing drop spacing down, it generally will allow you to slow down more. But the key thing is, is every time you make a plat pass, according to research that Jim Berdoski has done down at Halfway Station, you're going to lose about a quarter inch of water to surface evaporation, not to leaf evaporation, just to what gets on the ground that you're going to lose a percentage of. Okay, so if you put on an inch of water, you're going to lose a quarter inch, so you're effectively going to get an inch of water on. If you put on two inches of water, you're going to get an inch and three quarters on because that surface evaporation is pretty well set. So the more you put on in a pass, the better off you are. So this just kind of shows you the various soil types. It's very rare to find a field like Leon was showing you that just has one soil type in it. Most of them have multiple soil types in them. One of the things that FieldNet Advisor does is tells you if you quit irrigating today, how much crop loss would you start with? And it's interesting that in corn you probably start with a 400 bushel yield and then every day from the day you plant it, you just keep giving away yield until you get down to whatever it is that you actually harvest. In the world of cotton, uh, you work on building yield and part of building that yield is stressing the cotton a little bit because uh, the cotton is a tree, right? And if you never froze it, if you supplied 100% of its need in water, it would grow into a 40 foot tall tree. Okay, but we're managing a tree to get fiber production from it. So you never ever manage cotton to 100% of its ET. You need to be managing to a percentage of its ET. And in our world where we're deficit irrigation, we need to be able to manage to a percentage of that deficit irrigation because we're never gonna keep up. And the water savings that you achieve through all of the scheduling it really isn't in the center of the season. You're just trying to keep up then, right? So it's how much can you save early and how much can you save late? And our experience would tell us that, um, that you're going to save about two inches to two and a half inches of water. So uh, this stuff tracks right along. This is uh, some stuff that came out of Nebraska. This would uh, fit very well with what I learned down in Lubbock this year where we did one. But in this case, two circles planted side by side, same day, same farmer, same hybrid, same everything. He had a little bit of yield increase that across the one circle is worth about three grand. Here he saved about uh, two and a half inches of water and in his world that was another $1,385. So the difference just by using irrigation scheduling for this guy was well over $4,500. Okay. At Lubbock we had two circles caddy cornered from one another's actually out by Rawls. Cotton planted same day, same producer. One of them was 80 inch LEPA, the other one was 40 inch uh, LEPA. Field net, field net advisor on the 40 inch. Uh, the other one we had field net and used uh, crop metrics on the south half of the circle and we used uh, just his normal irrigation methods. So on his normal irrigation, um, he, uh, he was putting on about an inch water every time he went around. Did some uh, irrigation scheduling held up a little bit on the, on the south half of the circle. Uh, what he's able to do was produce exactly the same crop with two inches less water. On the 40 inch drop spacing, we saved an additional half inch of water. So we saved two and a half inches of water over what he normally did. We grew 100 pounds more cotton per acre, which is probably 
mostly had to do with precision application of the water getting using the 40 inch drops. But in and amongst that, because we backed off sooner and we were backed off a little more, we were able to be two cents higher in the grade. So all of that works out, and this is the same gallons per minute per acre, but what that worked out to for that producer was a $25,000 swing per circle over what he was doing versus what he could do. And we see that in a lot of different, different ways that you look at that stuff. So comparison in that stuff in Nebraska, uh, the Field Net Advisor and the uh, Soil Moisture Probes track very much along, along the same line. So there's three types of uh, VRI, uh, sectional based, uh, zone control, and then precision. Uh, you don't see much of these two uh, to do uh, precision VRI on a quarter miler with 30 inch drops, you'd be looking at about $65,000. To do zone control on a uh, 30 inch spaced uh, quarter miler, you're probably looking at about $35,000. To do sectional based VRI, you're looking at zero dollars. And that's the reason you do that. So ET's constant across the field, but the soil types and stuff change. I'm just going to run through this. But it's about optimizing and using all of that control available to you. Um, one of the things that FieldNet allows you to do is to put as many people on it as you want. So, and you, it allows you to segment that out. So if you want your agronomist to help you with some stuff, you can have them with their own login with only the fields that you want them to look at so that they can look at it yet not control. You can have people that can, can uh, control but they can't change, um, change settings. And then you have people that uh, can change anything, the people that are managing the operation. So there's a lot that's there that can be very helpful to you in managing it. Uh, recommend that regardless of whose system that you're using, that everyone have their own login. Because if somebody accidentally leaves your operation, you need to just be able to go and trash the bucket and, and delete their account so that they can't control your system. It's way better than having to reset everybody's username and password and that kind of stuff. And it gives you control. That way at least you can see who's doing what. Um, one of the things I, I want to point out is, is um, the barrier to using variable rate irrigation, the barrier to using irrigation scheduling is how much time does it take, right? Okay. The answer to this, and we had this discussion several years ago in Amarillo with the group of people that were researching variable rate irrigation and how, what the next things are going to look like in irrigation is, is if you know all of that ET stuff, if you know all the soil types, plant dates, where you're at and that kind of stuff, you can spend hours generating schedules for crops. What FieldNet Advisor does for you is it puts it into your queue up of things so you can run a dynamic variable rate irrigation plan every day and it takes you about 15 seconds. Long enough to go in, click on the plan and run the plan. Okay, if you want to modify the plan, it takes about a minute. Because it's tracking all this stuff for you. Now, if you want to get your spreadsheets out and do that, by all means do it. But the beauty to it is, is we've eliminated moisture probes. Because we're good in the field. Does it eliminate your need to go out and check soil moisture? Absolutely not. Do moisture probes give you good data? Yeah, they give you good data for the area that you put them in. But I've never yet had one of you producers come to me and say, you know what? My day is great today. I'm going to get to go put in 60 moisture probes. And tomorrow I get to put in 60 more. And the good news is, is I'm only two weeks behind with getting them in, and I'll have to pull them out at the end of the season. But if this is tracking this stuff for you every day, and your job is, is to just go out and verify that it's on track, then that's, that's where we're trying to get to. Okay? And it allows you, on your phone, to go in and adjust plant growth stage. If it's off, reset it, it resets a model. Every time you get a rainfall event, go in and adjust your soil moisture to what it is. Those are great opportunities to adjust your soil moisture. One of the things that we will do for you guys is there will be a report that you can print out from this system that will meet all of the NRCS needs for reporting. 
So your need to gather up data and report to the NRCS because we're tracking rainfall and everything else. For their basic irrigation water management, there will be a report there that you can go in and print. And so your amount of time that we'll, you'll dedicate to being able to print that report will be just a couple of minutes per people. Okay. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you all to do this. And precision BRI, I, I'm just going to show you so every drop has a valve and is controlled individually. So any polygon that you can describe underneath that field. You can describe anything you want, any kind of polygon that you want with GPS. And with that, you can put the water exactly where you want it into each of those pieces of pies or not put any water in there. It also allows you to do some things with uh, taking the water flow that you have, matching it through the meter uh, on the machine, and pulsing all of the nozzles and be able to uh, put that water exactly where it needs to be. So it's it's pretty, it works really well. The problem is, is it's just, it's not economically viable in most people's operations. You really have to have something special to want to do that, so. Um, so with that, um, I wanna jump on a website right quick and show y'all a couple of things if I can, but uh, I'd be willing to answer any questions. Have any of y'all looked at FieldNet Advisor at all? So, Brian, what do you think? It was pretty accurate last, this last year. The first two years, three years ago? Two years ago. It, it yeah. was a little bit wonky, but I think they got the bug work out of it, and it was dead on pretty much the most of the season. And, you, yeah, you, you do, I mean, depending kind of on the weather, you do have to go in there and adjust a little bit every now and then, but it's not very often. Now, that's, that's kind of... Where I'm at with it too. So, let's see if I can get this hooked up. Maybe, maybe I missed it. But we have to run the no, we cannot. We'll run the other guys. No, they will work. It's it's one of those deals. Uh, there's absolutely nothing that prevents you from using it outside of you've got to have field net because it won't work with something that doesn't track it by every degree that it goes around. It can't, it can't generate that kind of data. Oh, that's HDMI only, so that won't work. Can I jump out to the internet What's here? What's the cost? Yeah. yeah, what is the cost? Okay, so the Don't cost... Don't the money! Okay, yeah, and that's the cool part about it. Okay, so FieldNet costs you somewhere... Most guys are... We reduced the price on FieldNet by 25% this year. So just your subscription on FieldNet went from $400 list to $300 list, less quantity discounts, less uh, auto renewals, okay? So that's, everybody's paying somewhere in the 200, 250 range. If you got radio stuff like Brian has, it's down in the way under $200, okay? On the, uh, the FieldNet Advisor list price is $450. And then you take your discounts off that, and everybody's paying somewhere in the 320 range or something like that. So, and that's by field. So it's 320 dollars for a uh, for a, uh, a half miler, or 320 dollars for an 80 acre circle. So it's it's really affordable. That's every year. Yes, every year. But like I said, we you know once we get our volume up, um, it allows us to. Uh, to do some things with pricing. And I don't know how many times y'all have got into something that a, that a supplier reduced the cost by 25%. I think that's kind of an anomaly. I don't know if this thing's going to let me get out to the Internet. Uh, let me see if it's going to let me. This is, I'm on your computer, so maybe it'll let me. Out there, I still know. The internet in here is just kind of crazy trying to get stuff to work. I, I have it working on mine, but uh, uh, let's, go, let's see if it'll take us there. Let's see if I spell that all right. There we go. So I have to go in the same way that you do. Everybody logs in in the same spot. If you downloaded the app, it allows you uh, to go to the demo mode without having to have an account. Uh, and if you do have an account, it'll let you to, uh, 
um, it lets you uh, go. You can go from the, you can go to the demo account or to your account, either one. So if you want to play with it, you can go in there and do anything you want to do. So uh, let's just go to fields because that's what I really want to show you guys. And I can walk you through anything you want to walk through as far as how FieldNet itself works. But the fields button is your irrigation scheduling button. It loads fairly decently, even given. Uh, okay. So, um, even given the fact that we got a really slow internet connection, it works really good. Where you got even a half decent internet connection. Come on, load up. Um, but the main thing is, is being able to go in. It's it's like all things in the computer world. Anything that, that you do trash in, you're going to get trash out. But if you'll do a good job of setting it up to start with, note your cultural practice, go in and, and adjust things. Uh, one of the things I want to note is, as we started out, and we didn't have the available water on this field set up right last year. But uh, right now it says this field is, is really in great shape because it's nice and green, which means it's right in there. The producer and I both went out there at the same time or the same day, uh, a few hours apart, and dug about four holes a piece, and we think this field has about 75% available water today, and that's what our green tells us. It's not in stress at all, even for this time of year. So um, set up, let's go to uh, field boundary. One of the things that's uh, nifty in field boundary is, is that uh, So you, to set up the field boundary or whatever else is you just draw a circle around it and then you can use this little button here and it sets it to the size of the circle that you have in the system. Um, soil zones is uh, nifty and this is where we pull that data from US Web Soil Survey. So as you look at the various soil types, it downloads this stuff in here automatically for you. And if you've got a little bitty area, let's say this was just a teeny area over here, you could go in there on this area and you could set this from its priority of normal to, to low priority and it wouldn't drive the irrigation recommendations for, that, for the field based on that. It would kind of ignore it. And you can have it ignored even further than that. Um, in, uh, properties under, well, let's go to crop zones first because this is kind of one of the important things that it does. So it, it allows you to choose uh, the crop that you've got and virtually everything we grow out here is available in the crop list. So all of these crops are available and we've got six more coming this year. Uh, including hemp for the guys in Colorado that have determined that they need to grow some kind of hemp underneath the circle. Um, uh, you put in your planting date, you put in your relative humidity or maturity from that planting date, it calculates the GDUs for you. Here's the, the tillage practice button, so if this were a no-till field, you could put no-till in there and it would default the residue cover to 60%. So if you had more than that, you just go in there and change it to 80%. Uh, we did some cotton after cotton stuff where we had about 20%. You can do that, just go up, click the button and save it, okay? If you were gonna download uh, from, uh, from, the in, from the net, you could go in here and download uh, up here on your crop zones. When you do that, you can download that from uh, from John Deere Connect or Climate Core, or the two partners that are doing that stuff now. 
uh, under settings. Okay, here's where you put your minimum irrigation amount. Uh, last year I couldn't get him to irrigate under a level that was less than an inch. He'll he'll irrigate to uh, to an inch or more anytime he irrigates this year. Once we get a crop established, he's figured out that slowing down is good. We'll probably slow down. He had no runoff problems. His only circle he had that he didn't have runoff problems. And we'll slow, probably slow that down to an inch and three quarters this time per application. Uh, it gives you your stress buffer available there. Um, so it gives you uh, some nifty things that you can do there. Uh, let's look at alerts. This is a really neat thing to see here. So it gives you all kinds of alerts. And so if you set a field up with FieldNet Advisor and uh, you've got all the alerts here, what I would tell you to do is go in there and set all of them to none because you don't need all that noise. You got enough noise in your life with just managing irrigation. You don't need noise in your life from irrigation recommendations. You need to look at that once a day. Let's go back to the dashboard. This is the uh, one of the neat things. Um, and I was telling you that it would generate an irrigation schedule for you in short order. And I'm going to show you how to force an irrigation schedule. So if you want an irrigation schedule on a field, you click on that button. The update started, and so most of this is going to be how well the, this internet connection uh, communicates back and forth. But uh, hopefully it'll give us a, an update. Usually it takes about 15, 20 seconds. And so that's how long it would take to generate a, uh, a schedule. So it's going to be more along the lines of how quick it actually is able to communicate. <coughs> Your variable rate irrigation schedules are right here. Here's one that he wrote himself. Here's some plans. Uh, see, this one was generated today at 8.03 8 this morning. Okay. So that allows you to dynamically go in and run those every day, take into account what's predictive, what you've already done, uh, any irrigation that you had in the field. If there's a spot that something happened, then it, it allows you to go in and it will dynamically uh, create that for you. One of the things here, uh, let's see, it's still, still working out there doing our, our deal. Uh, adjustments are really important. Um, Irrigation adjustments, we didn't make any irrigation adjustments on this, but let's say somebody ran one dry and you needed to keep up with the water on it and they ran it 20 degrees from zero to 20, okay, and you wanted to, and it was putting on an inch and a half of water, so you could put 1.5 and save that and it adds an inch and a half water in that area so that you can keep up with your as applied irrigation. So that's really important to driving all the models to make them work. Um, available water, yes, I want to leave. Available water is one of those things where after a rainfall event is a great time to adjust any available water out there and you can do that by crop or by crop and soil type and the ones that we made were by crop. And so, uh, let me see if I can scroll down here. Uh, we made two adjustments, both of those after rainfall events. We had good we had good rainfall. It was it was standing in the rows and stuff. We made two adjustments this last year. Set them both. Reset them both to ninety percent. We were off by about two percent, but there was no reason not to take it uh, take advantage of the ability to adjust that soil moisture then. And you can track your irrigation events as as being different. But one of the things that FieldNet Advisor does is it. Um, it does not keep tracking irrigation or rainfall after a point that you're reaching just total saturation and runoff. And by example, we had a field down at Pearsall, got nine inches of rain over two, two weeks, and it quit tracking rainfall after four inches because everything was totally saturated. So what it was able to take advantage of, it tracked. Uh, crop growth settings and whether it's corn, cotton, wheat, whatever, you have to track your uh, crop growth settings, all of this stuff can be done out in the field. Uh, on this particular deal, we had made an adjustment here at second leaf. Uh, we made an adjustment at first square and first bloom. We were off by a day 
on each one of those where we felt like we'd hit 50% or more of the field. And the rest of the year, there were no adjustments that were made in this field. And uh, it gave a recommendation to quit watering. He wasn't comfortable with quitting watering, but he went ahead and did it. And that's how we saved the two inches of water. That's how we got the better grades, and that's how we got the yield. Okay. This is totally doable across the board, regardless. I believe in crop. Our experiences are kind of across the country. If you're seriously irrigating, even if you're deficit irrigating, uh, it allows you to, to go in and uh, um, do some things that allows you to, to tap the brakes. You know, and that's kind of the key thing. But if you save two inches of water, you're going to pay for that $450. You'll pay for all your monitoring, okay? If you raise a little more crop in addition, and that's almost like a bonus. If you get a better quality out of it, that's like another bonus. So there's kind of no reason to do that. Here's uh, one of the deals uh, we were talking about, you know, at what percent of ET do you run at to keep it from screaming at you all year? Because we're not going to hit 100% of ET on virtually any crop that we grow out here, right? We don't have enough water. So you set it to a percent of ET that's based on what your knowledge is of your farm and your water supply and what you want to do. You would never, ever try to grow cotton to 100% of ET. It just doesn't work. But somewhere between 65 and 75 is probably a pretty good number. And so if you drive off of that, you're pretty good. The key, key thing is, is if you really want to to go in there and mess with it, and which we did on this one, we changed it to 60% of ET at the end uh, after we had decided to quit irrigating so that it quit driving recommendations altogether because we wanted to just have a screeching halt on it. But you can, you can cut, you can make a cutoff on it. But it does give you recommendations in your corn. It tells you how much crop loss that you have. But like I say, it's trash in, trash out. If you do a good job with your setup, if you do a good job with maintaining that stuff, and all of your adjustments can be made in the field, on your phone, your tablet, whatever you have with you. You do, don't have to write it down and figure it out and come back to the shop. And if somebody else makes that adjustment, it's immediately viewable for everybody. So if you happen by after your agronomist has happened by and he's already made an adjustment, it's not like both of y'all are going to be looking at the same adjustment. And as soon as you make that adjustment and save it, save it, it resets the model. Okay, okay let's cut it here. Uh, 15 minute break, Ferris is up there, he's got it up. Yep. So you can go on up. I'd be, ha oh, one thing I'll tell you, if any of you guys are interested in doing uh, field, net, field net advisor, uh, I will help you get hooked up on field net. We'll hook you up with whatever you need. We'll do the first year subscription on Field Net, and we'll do the first year subscription on Field Net Advisor. For those of y'all that know what that is, that's about three thousand dollars worth of stuff. Yeah, the two of them got to go together, or they, yeah, they need to go together. Regardless of the type of pivot it is, regardless of the size of field, regardless, regardless.